It's my great, great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. Peter Eisman is an old friend of Syracuse University. His affiliation with the school goes back, uh, I think, about 30 years now. Peter's also a good personal friend, and our affiliation, Peter, goes back 40 years. <laughs> 40 years this month. If you, if you start up, they'll, they'll get the true story, so... Uh, Kelly, can you turn off his microphone, please? <laughs> you better be careful, that's all. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment for 40 years now. In thinking about how I might introduce Peter, it occurred to me that the very first question one must ask is which Peter Eisman we should speak about, because in fact there are several. There is of course Eisman, the architect and builder. This is the Peter who is well known to all of you. His practice has followed a remarkable trajectory beginning with a small toy museum in Princeton, followed by a series of rigorously abstract houses, through the Wexner Center in Columbus, a housing project in Checkpoint Charlie, a school of architecture in Cincinnati, a football stadium, a football stadium <laughs> in Phoenix, and currently an entire cultural complex nearing completion in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. There was also a recently finished memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. This is a project of stunning elegance, compelling power, and extraordinary subtlety. This is Eisenman, the fabricator of the architectural uncanny. And then there is Eisman the writer, author of numerous articles, essays, books, spanning nearly a half a century of production, from his doctoral thesis at Cambridge to books with fanciful titles such as Houses of Cards, Codex, and Diagram Diaries. His writings have traced a rigorous examination of the formal, cultural, critical underpinnings of the built environment and its relation to other cultural systems. The range of his inquiry and the volume of his output are nothing short of staggering. But this is an Eisman who is also well known to many of us. From his I I writings, we are introduced to Eisman the philosopher. I won't have to explain this incarnation. Suffice it to say that Peter's pedigree follows a lineage that must begin with Aristotle's rhetoric, passes through Thomas Aquinas via the rabbinical group, then on to Nietzsche, Nietzsche's aesthetics, and into Ferdinand de Saussure's linguistics, around Levi Strauss's structuralism and uh, arriving for an extended period at the deconstructivism of Jacques Derrida. This is heady stuff, but nonetheless emblematic of Peter's insistence and persistence at always locating the architectural discourse squarely within the realm of advanced cultural theory. A bit less well known, but certainly an important constituent in this mix is Eisman the Impresario. This particular Peter founded and directed the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies for 15 years between 1967 and 82, located on the 20th floor of 8 West 40th Street overlooking Bryant Park. The Toot, as it was known, was a kind of architectural think tank built around a group of young architects, theoreticians, and urban designers, including Kenneth Franklin, Stan Anderson, Mario Gonzalez, Diana Agrest, Peter Wolf, and Tony Vidler. For all those years, I don't think the ledger books ever saw black ink, and, I yet, and yet it managed to become an unparalleled and singular force in the world of architecture and contemporary discourse. During that period, it ran numerous symposia, exhibitions, lectures, <coughs> and published 26 issues of Oppositions magazine, which to this day is still the benchmark for what an architectural journal should be. Our own Mark Robbins interned at the Institute, and I know he credits Peter and his experience there with the firing of his own ambitions towards a life in architecture. To this day, I don't know how Peter managed to keep that place afloat from year to year, but I know that there are many of us who miss the Institute and will always lament its eventual demise. There are many other Eisenmans I could describe to you, including Eisenman the lecturer, who you will have the pleasure of meeting tonight and Eisman, the agent pr provocateur, who might also make an appearance this evening. Largely unknown is Eisman, the fanatical fan of Rutgers <laughs> football team. That Peter can be found in the dome tomorrow cheering on the loser team from New Jersey. <laughs> you want me to get my hat, man? <laughs> 
However, the Eisman I'd like to tell you about is Peter the teacher and mentor. This is the Eisman I know best and one that few rarely talk about. My own first encounter with Peter was as a sophomore at the Union. I was walking past the classroom where this young guy was lecturing to a group of upperclassmen. I had heard some reports about this new instructor whose approach to architecture was unusual and interesting, so I stopped in the doorway and listened for a while. I remember being struck by the rationality and the logic that he brought to bear on what was, for me, a fairly mysterious phenomenon. I found it quite stimulating and decided to register for his course the next time it was offered. This was postponed by a couple of years due to something called the draft. But when I got back to school in 1970, Peter was there and I was able to take his seminar on the formal analysis of Renaissance and modern facades. This course consisted of weekly close readings of great facades from those periods. It was a popular course and other instructors such as Robert Slutsky and Charlie Blockby and Rick Scafidio and occasionally John Haydock would occasionally drop by to sit in. Peter's approach proceeded from the intellectual traditions of Frankel, of Whitcomber, of Rome, but it transcended all of them through the very focus and deep analysis to which he subjected each reading. The underlying premise to this inquiry was that within the formal dimension of architecture there resides universal truths about the mechanisms of perception and the underpinnings of meaning. In a very particular way, this was for me the moment when the light bulb went on. The experience of, oh, went on, the light bulb went on, I should say. <laughs> the experience of this course also planted the seeds for lifelong interest in the building facade as the principal site of representation and meaning. Just before graduating, Peter surprised me by asking to work for him on a commission for a private residence. His invitation to be his assistant carried with it the caveat that after two years, assuming that I lasted that long, Peter would fire me. <laughs> the point being that he wasn't interested in creating a protege, rather the relationship really was that of a research assistant. He offered to pay me the whopping sum of $100 a week. I accepted figuring I could moonlight on evenings and weekends to make up the difference. At the time, Peter's office consisted of the two of us in a small room with a nice view of the city. These circumstances were enhanced by the office's location within the larger complex of spaces that made up the institute. This proved incredibly fortuitous for me, since the institute served as an architectural exchange that brought to its doors the likes of Michael Graves, Robert Stern, Manfredo Tafuri, James Sterling, Robert Smithson, Harata Itsosaki, Frank Gehry, just to name a few. Also during that period, I remember that there was this tall, quiet guy from the Netherlands who was in this back room working on a book. That guy turned out to be Grant Kuhlhaus and he was in the Lyrics, New York. Yeah. It was an incredible place. It soon became clear to me that Peter had this remarkable ability to draw around himself the best, the brightest, and the most influential. I then realized that more than a job, I actually had entered a kind of postgraduate finishing school where Peter was the headmaster. Interestingly, actually, others saw the institute as a kind of architectural mafia with Peter in the role of Don Pietro. <laughs> I'll, let history, I'll let history sort that one out. In any event, part of the curriculum I was expected to follow included early morning games of chess. At the time, there was an international championship competition taking place in Reykjavik between the Russian, the Soviet grandmaster, Boris Slavsky, and the uh, American nutcase, uh, Bobby Fischer. One day, Peter handed me a New Yorker article about the match written by George Steiner. He said, read this, come in early tomorrow morning, and bring a chess set. Thus, over the course of the next few weeks, we played chess each morning between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Peter was a much better player than me, but I was determined to take him to task. And so I bought a how-to book, and each night I studied opening and mid-game strategies in the naive hope that I might offer a credible challenge. Day after day, he humiliated me. <laughs> Until one day, I actually brought the game to a draw. We never played chess again.
Now, I'm not sure that I actually did that or that Peter allowed it to happen, but after a while I understood that I had completed a particular course of study, which was, as it turned out, a prelude for a more advanced seminar. The advanced seminar was the design and construction of House 6. The process was a discursive one that began with a relatively simple transformation of a generic cube. The first moves were somewhat arbitrary, not unlike the first couple of moves in chess. If you play chess, you know that it doesn't really matter necessarily that you move out your knights or your pawns, but rather, in doing that, you create a context, a kind of a, a charged field, as it were, in which each subsequent move is consequential in an accumulative fashion. And so the house became this <clears throat> game of three-dimensional chess in which Peter was the grandmaster driving the process, and I served as the novitiate, the student responding with countless models and diagrams interpreting the opening and mid-game strategies desperately trying to intuit where the game was headed. Encounters with the client were remarkable lessons in persuasion. Here was Peter, salesman extraordinaire. But the most interesting moments were those of conceptual breakthroughs, such as the day Bob Slutsky came by for a review of the project. Up to that moment, we were a bit stymied by the need to make the inverse symmetry legible. The house was conceived without reference to a primary sort of ground plane. It was intended to be understood either right side up or upside down. You could literally turn this thing conceptually out of way. So this produced a dilemma of how would you read that actually in, in the environment when it exists obviously in relation to the ground plane. In all of the earlier houses Peter, Peter had done, the presence of the staircase was always problematic. No matter how the stair was situated, its formal signature always was subordinated to its functional sign. In House 6, Peter inserted a second stair, an inverted one, to challenge the persistence of this semantic reading. Sletsky, a painter, saw that the solution was in the use of color, something Peter had purposely excluded in all of the prior works. This, thus, the right side upstair would become green for go, and the upside downstairs would become red for no-go. It was exactly the right solution, and over time this became one of the most iconic images of the house, and for me one of the most instructional lessons. There are many other stories about House 6 I could share with you, like the mystery of the hanging column, the gravity-defying cantilever bathtub, or the, by design, hole in the bedroom floor, which required that the clients could not sleep together in the same bed, they had to sleep in separate beds because that slot had to stay there. <coughs> Suffice it to say that the experience of working on that wacky house was, uh, with Peter was among the most cherished of memories that I have. True to his word, Peter did fire me at the end of uh, the two years. <laughs> or rather, he had to let me go. Towards the end, money got really tight. American Express was threatening to pull his card. And the phone company was about to terminate service. I had been working the last 12 months without pay and couldn't afford subway fare. By the way, Peter, you still owe me 1,200 bucks. <laughs> when I asked Peter what I might do next, he said, go teach. I said, I didn't know how or what to teach. And he responded, this is the reason to do it. <laughs> to learn. And so I did. While I would like to believe that my experience with Peter was unique, I know it was not. There were individuals before me and many since who were fortunate to have the many Peters as a teacher and mentor. Now in his 75th year, he is, in his uncanny manner, still building and writing, teaching and mentoring, philosophizing and provoking, and oh yes, cheering for that loser team in New Jersey. <laughs> For all of these Eismans, architecture is the home team, and you will always find Peter out in front leading the charge. Please join me in welcoming Peter Eisman. to make. One is that um, 
Uh, I've changed the subject of my lecture uh, after having worked like hell to get it ready for being here. I thought, how can I subject these people uh, on a Friday afternoon to Jacques Derrida and a microanalysis of the effect of Derridian thought on the corner in architecture? How could I do that? Uh, and I thought to my subjects, don't do that, Peter. <laughs> you know, these kids have had a tough season. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's have a little fun before tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, I changed the talk. So any of you who want the Derrida talk will have to send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll uh, email back to you. Um, and, and I have proof that the disc was here, so I was going to do that. The other, so therefore, also I found out that it was a Muslim holiday today. It's not something that I had been aware of. I apologize to any people who I feel that this lecture would be an affront to their uh, religious beliefs. So I changed the lecture to a Muslim project uh, that I recently finished. So in a sort of feeling that that would at least commemorate the holiday. Uh, that's the second uh, point I had to make. The third is, I am such a fan, uh, unfortunately, uh, of uh, this particular group from New Jersey, uh, where my father went and played and my mother went and I was taken uh, in 1937 to my first game, uh, which is, uh, I guess, six, 70 years ago. Uh, I went to my first game, probably somewhere around this time of the year. Uh, so. I'm not here to give just the lecture, uh, as you realize. This is only the, the subterfuge that Mark is able to justify uh, getting me here. Or I'm, but it's the subterfuge that my, my, my wife and my child and my young son are very upset about because this turns out to be parents weekend at my son's boarding school. And um, when that uh, notice arose in uh, August, my wife looked at me and she said, you know, you can always change your Syracuse lecture. Uh, and I said, yeah, I could do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, Sam really likes it when you come up to school. And I said, yeah, I do know, and I love going up to school. Uh, she said, so when I kissed her goodbye this morning, she said, all I can say is you guys better win. So uh, I've got a, I'm here on a mission uh, because otherwise I can't go home. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that we recently finished this summer. Um, that my good friend Jeff Kipnis says is the best thing we've done since uh, the last 20 years. Um, I asked him this morning uh, on a long distance call to Salt Lake City where he is, could Jeff, could you tell me, because I've got a, I'm going to a lecture on the project tonight, could you tell me why it's interesting? And uh, because architects don't know why their projects are interesting. He said, you know, make up a story. <laughs> It'll do. So this is not the Jeff Kipnis version of the project. This is the Peter Eisenman version. I really love this project. Uh, I can't tell you why. Um, I'm really excited about it because um, at 75 it represents uh, a, a rethinking of some of the things that we've been working with. And I want to talk about those issues before I show you the pics. I was at Harvard at a jury last spring. And what was interesting about this jury were all the projects were single surface 
um, modeling projects uh, with algorithms that I, I don't know what they were, but clearly uh, quite advanced, and I don't understand computer language. But in any case, um, I was disturbed by several things. And of course, when I get disturbed when, through my 20 years of analysis, the analyst always says, when you're disturbed, that's when you've got to look at why. And I was wondering why it disturbed me. Because first of all, it was authorless work. In other words, you just let the machine run and it produces things. And it ran and it didn't matter if they were producing a hospital, a school, or whatever. The same forms could produce anything. And uh, wasn't that what I was about? Uh, wasn't that what all of my work uh, was trying to uh, get rid of the author, get rid of function, and just let things run? Um, and then I realized the sort of problem for me was a kind of determinism. In other words, what I would call a, a techno-digital determinism had crept in and uh, was now a, a new kind of hierarchical uh, thing that if you couldn't do this stuff, you were a wonk. And uh, if you didn't understand what it was, you also were the same. And, and of course, as a teacher, I was required to say something intelligent about these things. And I couldn't because I didn't know what the value judgments that were necessary uh, to be made. And um, I was particularly taken by one student's uh, work uh, making uh, milled models, which were interesting. Um, and I was not interested in what he did with the models. I was interested in the models themselves as abstract entities. And uh, I started stacking these things up on one another, and uh, they're not, they were not stackable, but it was like putting one hand on top of another hand and another thing. And I began looking at the section of uh, inventing a section of this work. <coughs> and I thought, this is interesting. So I asked the young student if I could have these models. They weren't what he had designed. They were just studies uh, of single surface uh, models that he had produced as, as a beginning. So I took these models um, and I brought them to New York and I assembled a team of, of computer whiz kids, one from Harvard, one from Princeton, and one from Yale, uh, just so there was no uh, overriding uh, ideology. And I brought them together and I said, look, tell you what I want to do this summer. I want to work on this competition uh, for the Sheikh Zayed Museum in Abu Dhabi. Um, but what I want to do is to take these models and I want to think of producing a project that is starts from section rather than from plan. Because I said, you know, the, 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 no matter what kinds of determinisms we think about, all of this single surface modeling still, in, in when, it, when it elevates into section, comes off of a plan. Um, and I said, what about if we invent a section uh, and then allow that section to distribute itself and plan? Of course, uh, functionally, you'll see that it, it creates problems doing this sort of thing. I mean, there's a reason why the plan is a generator because people think that function is a generator. Um, <clears throat> in any case, that was one of the uh, ideas that could we make a sectional uh, project as opposed to a plan as, as a fundamental disturbance to thinking about architecture. The, the second issue uh, came up was that um, the question of the indexical project. Now, the indexical project has been a hallmark of my work since 1978. Um, and after 20 years of work on the index, it no longer becomes a didactic and confrontational discourse to postmodernism or uh, any kind of semantic. And one needed to find a, a, 
another way of thinking uh, about signs in relationship to to their signified. And um, I began reading, uh, I had begun reading, I should say, before this, waiting for the moment when I could employ this kind of thinking uh, on this particular, uh, on a particular project. And I was reading about, there were about four books. Uh, I, I mentioned once, I think, the last time I was here, Theodore Adorno's book, uh, and Edward Said's book, uh, both talking about late style. Um, and I read over the summer uh, a book by Thomas Pynchon, one of my favorite authors, uh, called Against the Day. And what's interesting about Pynchon and Against the Day, it is a book conceived of uh, as in itself a late style book, because Pynchon is in, in his late style, but also uh, it's conceived about a moment in time, a historical period around the Chicago World's Fair, which was also a moment of late style, in other words, before uh, modernism. And what Pynchon is telling us and what uh, Adorno talks about and Said and all of these people talk about the fact that unless there is a new paradigm or a new discourse, a, a new epistem that Foucault would say, we are bound to, to move into at some point in time in history into what is called late style. Now late style is not mannerism, which is the reaction to the high style mannerism, but late style is a quirky, finicky attitude toward meaning and form that in a sense does not preempt, uh, uh, permeate the idea of knowing, understanding, etc. It is a sort of experimentation that does not have as a goal uh, clarity, let's say. And um, Pynchon's novel, this particular one, is, is clearly in that vein. Uh, uh, Said cites Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, which he said is, is, is very different than, than all of the other Beethoven uh, compositions, and that uh, its objective is very different. Uh, and he also cites Adorno's late writing as very different from his early writing. And I believe we are in a period of lateness. Uh, I believe it is a very difficult time for young people like yourselves to be uh, avant-garde because there hasn't been a new epistem, there hasn't been a new paradigm. And so one of the things I want to talk about tonight is what do you do in a moment of lateness when all you want to do is newness uh, or earliness, and uh, which is a natural idea. Now, Pynchon is a very interesting uh, example because what Pynchon does, even though he sets the book into an historical context of lateness in the late 19th century, he's talking about young people flying around the World's Fair in balloons, in spaceships, and in, in all kinds of new kinds of fangled aircraft as a sort of vision of the future. And what Pynchon is saying is, is that in the moment of lateness, if one looks carefully, there's the possibility of the new. That is, the possibility might be sort of seated within the work of lateness. And that interested me. I thought, hey, I'm late myself. Uh, I've always been late. But would it be interesting to experiment with lateness as a teaching tool, as a design tool, and see where it goes, like Pynchon's uh, <clears throat> novel? So if we're no longer interested in the indexable project, and we're interested not in, as it were, the close reading that we had before, but a different kind of reading, then maybe we could find a post-indexical uh, close reading of our moment, which would be very different than past kinds of close reading. The last thing that I set up 
uh, in this, first of all, it's about, architecture has always been about the relationship of a thing to a human being. And architecture throughout, we could describe the subject-object relationship uh, as the dominant mode because the subject clearly is always within architecture or without architecture, physically, mentally, uh, functionally, uh, meaningfully, etc. And I began to examine uh, how those subject-object relationships change in moments of, of confrontation in other disciplines. And I began looking at, uh, I was going to talk about Richard Serra's work and, and Richard Serra's new work as an example of lateness tonight. Uh, I began looking at people in film like Michael Snow when he started to work on, on, on film that involved the subject. And last Thursday night, I went to a film which, um, I, I don't recommend this entertainment, but if you want to know what I'm talking about in terms of the new subject-object relationship, uh, you should see Michael Haneke's new film, Funny Games. Uh, it is the most terrorizing experience I've had in a movie. You witness no killing, no bloodshed, no anything, but you sit there as if uh, you're in a frenzy uh, and terror. I, I felt that walking out on the street, I was going to run into a, a psychotic killer. Or, you know, when the de elevator door opened, I remember in the building we were in, uh, and somebody got in, I thought, oh my God. You know, I was, I was absolutely uh, in, a, in a state, as a viewer, where, which I've rarely been in in a film, all right? And I think that Haneke was trying to say, look, in the media age that we're in, in this moment of lateness, the subject, that is all of us, have become passive. And we don't know how to uh, participate. Not to be active, but how do we participate in a film? And Haneke's films from Cachet to Code Unknown and to this uh, Funny Games is a way of, of, of saying to the subject, hey, look at yourself. Because I, I came out of this film and um, I thought, why do I go to a film like this? It's, it's, you know, what kind of experience is this? Shouldn't films be entertaining? And then I realized, oh my God, here I am supposedly a quasi-intellectual academic saying I want entertainment from my films, right? Uh, something I've always been against. So what Haneke did was to push me against the wall uh, about what, I was, what it was like to be a spectator uh, watching his film. Now, I only say this as a preface. I'm having a discussion with Mr. Haneke on Monday night um, as a kind of conclusion to my weekend. And I'm really very excited about it. He is very interested in my work, and I'm interested in his work, and so we're going to have, have this discussion. But I think it's a meeting of late minds. Uh, and, I, and I think this issue of lateness, I think, is, is, becomes very important to this project that I'm, I'm going to show you tonight. Okay, um, that is a background. Um, I want to uh, show the project, and then we'll take questions uh, after and uh, see what you know, comments and whatever that you have. Um, I mean, I've laid out a broad brush uh, condition. I, I could have done a very meticulous close reading tonight, but I thought it would be better to lay out the grounds in, under which you work and I work today in which we work, uh, and that uh, makes it both exciting and difficult uh, to do that. So with that in mind, can we uh, turn the lights out and we'll look at the pics. Are you going to be here? Because I can be over here. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm...
I'm, I'm moving around. I have the, yeah, I have it. This is the conclusion. Um, that's what we produced. Um, uh, it's another landscape. Um, doesn't look like a building. Uh, I'm certain we have no chance in the competition. Uh, but that, that's what we sent. Um, <laughs> Okay, we always do a, a site analysis, um, and we were given uh, this particular symmetrical, <coughs> centralized, um, and I'm sorry, I, I've got to do a PS, I've got to back up a second. Another one of the investigations of the moment of lateness is the relationship of part to whole composition. Um, and what one has always been interested in is that from Alberti to the present, the, the object has always had this part to hold, the, the house to the site, the site to the street, the street to the neighborhood, the neighborhood to the city, the city to the region, etc. There was always this relationship. And what we saw in this site plan was a very symmetrical site that had a, you know, a part, what we would consider a part to hold. It was uh, binuclear, this main axis down here. Um, there was a, a, a waterway that ran through here. And it was planned by Skidmore Owings in Maryland, had really nothing to do with Abu Dhabi, uh, with the Bedouin nature of, of the people, uh, the, the nomadic quality, and anything at all. Um, and it didn't even recognize in its centricity. This was where the, the, the giant statue of Sheikh Zayed would be. Um, the fact that while the arc of this circle went through John Nouvelle's museum, Zaha Hadid's museum, Tato Ando's museum, it missed Frank Gehry's uh, museum, um, which is one of the things that started this. Um, and we began to uh, look at uh, the, the, the site, which is over here. That is the circle, which is this circle. And then there's a larger uh, center, which is the entire convention center district here. Uh, there, is, there are vectors, therefore, from this center to this center, which uh, are real in the site, and here to the al Hassan Fort, which is here, another vector, uh, which is very important in the landscape. So we were doing a site analysis as if this part to whole condition didn't exist. Uh, the, uh, here is a larger scale view of this. And what we did, we took the to the center of the cultural center and, and had this circle here which gave us this arc. But then we made an arc here which is the center of this circle is the center of these four museums. So we had these two centers, we had the fort um, which uh, for us uh, denied the centricity and part to whole relationship about here. Now what they had in mind, the competitor, the competition organizers, was that this would be the focal point of the center, the museum, which we were supposed to do, would be here, uh, and the, they were going to have a Biennale, an art biennale every two years. Uh, this would be the center of the art biennale. And basically they wanted a building that looked like this, and a building that looked like this, two uh, half-moon buildings, or uh, half circle buildings uh, to reinforce the part to whole relationship. And since they were sitting with these fabulous uh, icons of lateness, uh, Rococo modern, I call it, um, they, they certainly wanted another one. And of course, this is precisely what um, 
we didn't want to do. Uh, um, when the client wants something, it's precisely when you go and do something else. Uh, this is the building density diagram, and this is the road uh, density diagrams. We were just, but as a as gridded uh, structures. Um, the uh, this these slides are out of order. Sorry. In any case, uh, I, I'm going to proceed because um, my. my assistant always likes to make me uh, make up a story about something that I'm not ready to make up. But uh, uh, I've, I've lost a slide. Um, but anyway, um, it'll come somewhere. I know. It'll, it'll, it's the first time we've done it. So Anyway, what happens is with these vectors that you see here, the, the lines, uh, the green and uh, blue lines, be begin to be warped and, and, and skewed. And so this is the kind of uh, template for the work that we were going to do. These forces skewing these gridded lines, producing something that completely obliterates uh, the, the, the great circle and the great symmetry of the site. Um, I gotta go forward. I gotta go. Uh, there you go. I gotta have this slide. One of the things that we started from was uh, the idea of an arabesque. I've used arabesques before, but being in a Muslim country and the fact that the the arabesque was uh, made as a critique of Euclidean geometry and the fact that these new computer algorithms are in themselves critiques of Euclidean geometry. Um, we went back to the 7th century uh, critique of Euclid um, and found the origins of the arabesque, which were basically single surface uh, horizontal schemes. And I said, look guys, let's find four arabesques of, of a different scale and different nature and stacked them on top of each other to produce section, not plan, because you couldn't get plan. And so my three uh, colleagues uh, found these particular forms. Uh, there could have been four others. Um, and we used these in, uh, as a ground, a frame, a canopy, and, uh, and an overlay uh, up above. You'll see there are actually four layers, which uh, bring these together. Now I'm going to go back. So we took those arabesques and we did, we allowed these, these force diagrams to uh, begin to distort the each level. And here you can see the, the ground level, you can see the original figure, the compression of the figure, the extension of the, of the, of the unit, the compression here, um, and uh, you get a, a varied uh, structure, which would be the, the, the ground level, let's say. Even though we were not conceiving this as a plan, that's what would be the, the, the desert forms, let's say, um, if, if one wants to talk like that. Um, clearly, um, this has no functional uh, value, no anything, but we were looking at it as maybe this could be where the museum is and this could be where the Biennale pavilions and they could relate across this way. This could be a major path to an open uh, plaza area up here above this circle um, and, and we would have to rejigger the whole site plan in order uh, to produce this project. Um, as a second strategy, we said, well, they're not going to buy all this. Why? We, we could just say, okay, there's the, there's the museum and the Biennale pavilions and forget all the rest uh, if we ever got that far. Um, there, this is the second level, which is the uh, continuous over under single surface path of, of movement. 
And the whole idea was that the path of movement never touched the ground or the walls of the ceiling. In other words, it was a continual, um, very similar in a, in a sense to the, the idea of the Holocaust Memorial where uh, you, don't, you, you, you don't go anywhere. And in other words, you keep doubling back uh, in an infinite gridded pattern. And this is uh, a doubling back that, wait a minute, that's an over and under. Uh, and you can see here the over and under. And it was very difficult to work out because we didn't want it to touch the ground. We didn't want it to touch the walls. We didn't want it to touch this. That was the whole idea, that these, this was a nomadic movement in space and time. And this would be a different kind of museum uh, since uh, there was no stopping and, and, and being next to anything. Because what we were arguing is that the Bedouins, 90% uh, of the Abu Dhabians were, were Bedouins. Uh, they didn't have many big things, uh, much art. They had blankets and various uh, pots and things, but the art was not native to this place. And so we thought as nomads, we would make a nomadic museum. And all of it was, in a sense, intended to be uh, digital projections and, uh, around this nomadic uh, path. Uh, the difficulty is that, you know, to get over and under and have wheelchair access and real kinds of considerations of, of different levels, uh, it was a, a very difficult process working that out as a circulation because we just took the distortions of, the, of this level, uh, distortions by the site. The last level is the canopy level. Uh, we needed an enclosure, uh, and uh, actually you'll see in section that the canopy level is two levels. Um, and, and these are uh, lightweight uh, steel panels uh, that reflect the sun um, and uh, give shade underneath. And there is that first uh, diagram that I showed you, um, the, uh, when you put all three of them together, uh, this is what you get. Um, and of course, this, I, I'm sorry to say this is another one of these that's out of uh, place because here is this same diagram. This should come before the other one. Here is the base diagram un undeformed uh, by the site conditions. Uh, that is the over the superposition of all three arabesques. Uh, here is the ground level, uh, the walkway and, and frame level, and the canopy level. Um, Guy Nordenson, the engineer in New York, uh, did the engineering, of, and it didn't because it's a very complex uh, condition. Uh, it was very difficult to structure this. We wanted to hang uh, this piece off of this piece, but ended up not being able to do that. They started to have legs and interfered with these. It, um, it's certainly not a resolved uh, project. I, I show it to you because it has a, a lot of things in it that I think are, are worth uh, talking about. Then we went and took that base condition in, into section because the section was really the issue and how it would, uh, we deformed the plan, uh, how does the section deform uh, as it were with it. And here, uh, this is the ground plane uh, and the, the sectional situation that you saw on these levels. Uh, here's the alignment to the site topography. Uh, and you begin to see this uh, other level, uh, the over-under level coming into uh, the structure of the spaces. Uh, and you begin to see the projection both down and up, uh, the projection down into the ground. Uh, the whole idea was that um, the, these things would be built into the sand, using the sand as molds for the concrete uh, floor, and you can see you can do this any number of times. Um, and 
and then the same thing happens, you can project up, uh, uh, and the roof then shifts up, so you get these kinds of shifts in the roof and in the ground. Uh, and then this is the new site topography, uh, which you see here, um, which has to be navigated by this uh, single surface walkway. Um, and there are the, uh, again, the three levels uh, with their material system. And what they look like in, in uh, axonometric projection when they're overlaid onto one another. And then uh, I'm going to show you a series of plans, and this is where the thing which was not conceived in plan breaks down because uh, you t they're hard to read. Uh, uh, we show the uh, museum, the pavilions, uh, and the rest of the site development. Um, and uh, what you, we had to do plans at this scale. So this is the sort of uh, under surface where all the services, uh, offices, uh, shipping, receiving, parking, etc. Uh, and if you can read these, you're better than I am. But uh, tracking through this is this single surface level. Uh, which makes it very difficult to read because uh, these things look like uh, spaces that you can walk on, but they're not. Uh, they merely show different uh, levels. And the walkway level is here. And the roof level. And there's the... Uh, the beginning of the sections that um, you can begin to see. Uh, here's one level of the walkway. Here's another walk in here, here. But they have they're they're anarchic, as it were, although single surface, with the, the volumes of the space. They they move through the space in a in a very strange way. As does, if you will see. There's the canopy roof, and then there's this other level, which is the frame of the, of the glass enclosure. So this is the glass enclosure, and these pods uh, exist, as it were, in the, in the ground. And none of the exhibition is in this area here, uh, which is merely uh, an, an air-conditioned uh, piece. But you see the way this uh, piece moves through uh, the canopy roof. Now, what we had wanted to do was to hang this level off of the canopy roof, but proved impossible. Uh, what you don't see here is there's another secondary structure, which for us is still a problem. And we're, we're, if we go any further with this project, uh, would uh, do something uh, else. But what is interesting for us is the way the, the human movement intersects the ground level is the same way that this uh, enclosure level intersects the canopy level, uh, both of them uh, being uh, single surface interfaces, uh, one with the ground, one with the, the canopy. Uh, this is a functional explanation. It, it doesn't do much to help. Um, but uh, structural uh, analysis, which was not the way we had planned it. Um, again, you see this level of, of structure, which comes off the secondary, uh, this particular secondary level as well. There's the required site model we made. This was a milled model. Um, and what you realize when you're into these kinds of uh, forms, you can't sit in your office and make uh, cardboard models or wood chipboard models or wood models, because we always study everything in that. But we could only study it in the computer. 
and um, we didn't see this model uh, until we were ready to ship it out. Uh, it was, it took a long time to get the computer program right and what you realize when you're working with either milled or printed models, um, the computer program has to be precise and if there are any interruptions in the program, the, the thing shuts down. So this thing shut down two or three times and you have to, somebody has to be sitting with it uh, the whole time. This took 48 hours of, of uh, night and day uh, to do. The, the little printed models that I'm going to show you took about 36 hours and I can't tell you how long it took to do the uh, computer uh, models for them. So anybody that thinks these things, the new technology speeds up, it, it doesn't. It affords you a very different uh, attitude toward uh, land, build form, uh, enclosure, uh, uh, openings, uh, and the object, uh, I think. There's one of the uh, sectional, this was a printed model. This took 36 hours uh, to do. Um, and you can see uh, the, we had done these um, trusses between the canopy structure and this secondary structure. Uh, and um, of course that's not the way uh, Nordenson uh, ultimately uh, was able to make it work. Uh, all of the other things were uh, placed, you know, in down into the land. And as I say, this is a this walkway, this, this, and this, as you can see, within these spaces, uh, is a continuous over/under loop uh, that you never get off. You never stop in a space. We, we, we started this model about two or three times and the computer program quit and it didn't work. Getting it to work is, is a very complex uh, issue. Uh, I don't know much about it, but I can tell you it is. And there's another view of the uh, section. Um, I feel a bit like a spectator to this because uh, while I um, I, I don't know what my role as the architect uh, was in this project, um, other than the um, I set the parameters uh, which set these people off, um, but I couldn't say much about what was happening uh, because I didn't know how to correct it or say, I, I'm not sure I like that. Uh, and I'm not sure I like this project, but uh, I think you, we ought to look at it together, um, and it's easier than talking about Derrida. I <laughs> there, the we 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 did any number of sectional perspectives. Um, it, it's, uh, I suppose, a uh, pretty strange internal environment. Um, I think one of the things that's characteristic of our work is that the internal environments are more uh, articulated and, and uh, active than the exterior environments. You would never, from that model, think that this is uh, what you have. This is my favorite uh, drawing because it really tells you about the spaces in the ground and the, the uh, space, you know, the, the trusses and the structural system and these canopies, these printed metal canopies with the arabesques overlaid into them, um, which uh, I'm very fond of this particular piece.
We have the lights. Um, I don't know how to. Um, I can explain the theoretical structure. I don't think this has anything to do with um, museums. Um, but it has something to do with architecture, I think. Um, I find it uh, interesting. I find it both similar to uh, uh, people think that it has qualities of the Holocaust project, uh, but in a different uh, key, uh, not in uh, Euclidean work. And um, I show it to you because um, I find it an intriguing project. Um, it has spurred now, we have two or three other projects uh, which are large scale um, urban uh, interventions that we are working on. Uh, these are not competitions but projects. We have a large project outside of Naples along the coast in a, in a fantastically interesting volcanic area which looks like this project, I mean, it's it's made. I mean, it's it's a it's an area outside of Naples which uh, has uh, part of it has slipped into the sea. Part of this volcanic area has erupted into a called a, a new mountain, and uh, it's an amazing, like moon-like landscape. And we are the intermediary structure between what has fallen into the sea and what has risen from out of the ground. Uh, and so that's one uh, project that deals with the land. The second is uh, the uh, site in Rome uh, where the old um, uh, Fiera was, the, the sort of convention center area, which has moved out and it's this um, completely derelict area um, and, you know, on the southern, southeastern edge of Rome on the way to um, Ostia, and um, we're we're fortunate to be able to uh, have these kinds of projects because I'm no longer thinking about <coughs> objects, even though I probably never have since the Counterreggio project. Uh, all of my projects have been, in a sense, landscapes and 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 non um, uh, object oriented. But I think the, the, the difference for me in this project, uh, important for me, is that the subject is treated in a different way. It is no longer a subject that reads closely. Uh, it is no longer a sub subject that uh, is passive. By the way, it can't be passive. There's no place to, as it were, stop and sit down. So you're on, as it were, a treadmill. Uh, through this experience. Uh, you don't know if you've seen it all or missed something uh, because you don't know where the path uh, takes you. There are no indications. It just, as it were, meanders continuously through spaces uh, and you can't get all, you can't say, gee, I want to go to this one next. You have to follow, as it were, the path in, in a way and, uh, and invent, as it were, uh, a narrative uh, from your experience. Um, I think that is all I want to say about the project. Um, I'd be very happy to hear comments or questions uh, about the relationship of this project to other works or the kinds of things um, that you all are thinking about. Thank you.
So it, this is probably the completest form of seeing it become both surface and material. Yeah. And, and yeah. Kind of in close space. The layering is beautiful. It's like more a um, On a the, the forms themselves are beautiful, and I can also see uh, Guy's hand in uh -huh. some of the deformations of the roof really kind of beautifully work between the excavations down below and the very kind of light deformations of the roof. But I, I, in listening to you talk about the work, you started out in your remarks speaking about the GSD being uh, in a review and seeing work which seemed like it was on autopilot. You said, well, yeah. how do I critique this? It's, it could be a hospital, it could be yeah. a museum, it could be anything. So then I, I look at this, and in fact, you do start from arabesques, and so the one could say, well, is it sort of context-based enough to be derived? And then you think, well, is that like going back to your work with codons and taking the forms mm -hmm. of the codon and then making a kind of science museum? Um, on the other hand, I look at this and I think about the Alhambra, I think about Islamic architecture, I think about souks, and the indeterminacy yeah. of souks within the colonial city. So it seems completely resonant with also historic forms in a marvelous way. So how do you speak about that relationship between things which are generated by exogenous uh, diagrams and forms and relatedness to site? Mark, I think that's a great critique because I don't think I can escape, you know, I started out and it sounded like the old Peter Eisenman, right? Uh, and I don't think the old Peter Eisenman's going to go away. Yet, that ain't the old Peter Eisenman on the thing. It, the thing should, the, the souk, you know, I was in the souk in, in uh, Tangier 40 years ago, you know, and I remember what it, you know, it was like feeling, you know, uh, not, not sure where I was, where I was going to be. Um, and certainly those resonances of, of the, the place, you know, we, did, we always do a lot of research into uh, what it's like to be in the desert and, you know, the, the, the whole fact that the desert, is, my, my, my text says that the, the desert is a flat, uh, to the casual observer, is a flat expanse. It isn't a flat expanse, it never is. And we thought we would capture, in some way, analogously, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I was trying to get in what I would call a... Okay, let, let me give you another shot at it to answer your question. I would argue that what Michael Haneke does in film is he takes what one would call the affective sensual aspect of being an observer and transfers it into the conceptual domain. He makes horror a thinking project, right? And uh, honestly, what we try to do here is to make sensuosity a thinking project. In other words, to shift the grounds of the traditional categories between thinking and feeling um, experience and, and knowledge, etc., and merge them. In other words, take it out of context. This is what Haneke and I are going to be talking about on, on Monday. Whether, A, that's what we do, and whether, in fact, it's possible to do that. In other words, take something that somebody would say, like Frank Gehry, is totally in the affective, sensual domain. He never shifts into the conceptual abstract domain, all right? Uh, Rem is in the abstract domain in a certain way, but he is in an, another thing about the subject, which I don't want to get into. But Greg Lynn, for example, is totally in the, in the conceptual domain, I think. And what, we, what I tried to do for the first time, because I live in the conceptual domain, I, you know, uh, all of the work has been that, to try and see if I could take piece out of the affective domain and move it into mine and to see whether I could do that. That's precisely what I uh, wanted to do. I don't know if it works or not, but there it is. Who do you find out? Um, we, don't, we don't know who the jury is. We don't know. We don't know if the models got there in one piece. 
I mean, I think it was worth showing the students something that you're not sure of. I mean, you know, uh, and you don't know, is it a good thing, a bad thing? Is it going in the right direction? So I thought it would be worth doing that. I want, I want Julie, to, to, to my landscape person, to discuss even following. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, well, you have a comment. You allow you to comment. No, I'm going to ask a question. Um, okay. Last time you were here, and you presented Santiago, you were talking about your desire to make these new grounds that were based on shifting away from vertical forces or extrusions into more vector-based work and horizontal uh -huh. forces. And so when I look at this, and we begin with the kind of making of the template, with the overlays of the arabesque patterns, and then you go to section, I'm wondering how, it seems like you, you're kind of back to where you were before Santiago. Well, let's say, theoretically, let's say I was trying not to be, and let's say I was. Okay, let's let's accept that because I'll, I'll I, I accept that as a critique. Does it produce something different than Santiago? Yes. Okay. And what is that? That's that's what I need to do. It's better. It's better. Yeah. I think it's a break. But you're right. It's sound. It's like pre Santiago going back and then rewinding the tape. Uh, but the tape somehow this time comes out different, better. I mean, it's almost too bad that I'm 75 as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I really feel like this is the work of, of a 40-year-old or 50, you know, and I got 25 years to, to really move it. Well, my mother's 99, so I, got, I, got a, I have a few years. But what is the difference? Tell me, how does that happen? I mean, I, I mean, in, 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 Okay, because the students want to know. You going to tell them tomorrow too? We'll go to the 50 yard line. Then. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a simple question, which is what's there to look at in the museum? What's compelling people to walk through? There's nothing. The architecture. They don't have any, they have no, they have no, nothing. I assume they will have, we, we, we showed projectional, you know, videos and things like that. But there is no, I mean, it's a, a, a museum. What Abu Dhabi is trying to do, which is an interesting idea, that oil is going to run out in 25 years. There's not going to be any oil left. And what they're doing is planning for the economic future where they have a, a cultural island in the desert where people will go for culture. They, I mean, why do they need five museums? They've already you know, commissioned four. This is another museum with a Biennale thing. So we're assuming it's going to be like a Kunsthalle, right? And what we're saying is, like we did at the Wexner Center, you've got to find the kind of art that allows people to see it in this kind of way, this kind of peregrination through space. Uh, and we set a challenge that this is not going to be like any other museum. Uh, and it was something that evolved out of the sectional ideas that we were working with. So, um, you know, curators would say, you can't have a museum like this. But the curators at the Wexner Center always said, we can't have a museum like that, and it's worked out very well. I'm assuming that as a challenge for curatorial and art, I mean, you know, painters will start painting things on the walls, I am assuming. Uh, you know, it'll be work that will be constantly, you know, moving, site-specific work, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the museological choice is really just a project. And at the same time, you said, well, I'm not really interested in it. No, I, I uh, it's okay. okay. Uh, but, but um, I guess the, the refusal to form a narrative, in other words, not to have a single way of understanding the world, understanding the space, seems to me to be very resonant with what I understand of where Abu Dhabi and the region in general is, in terms of its own kind of cultural identity, in terms of the role of an institution like a museum, so, you know, I actually think it's really interesting. I mean, you know, I'm, I guess I'm 
in a way, reacting to your sort of um, uh, downplaying. Well, I had to down. I mean, I mean see, I'm trying to understand uh, uh, what this is. Because it sounds like you're criticizing, you're saying, look, they can't do the conventional museum of fetishized objects. They don't have that culture of business. Well, they have four other museums for that already yeah. Yeah. done. They already have the fetishized objects. Yeah. And, and so I'm really intrigued by the way that, that your work acts critically in institutional terms, not just in formal terms. terms. Thank you. Yeah. Here. Yeah, we need the microphone. Go ahead. We'll, we'll get everybody. All right, I have a question. Um. <laughs> when it comes to, uh, I guess I'm going to use the word imposing, but imposing newer uh, organizational strategies into places like the R4 and to yeah. the kind of things that probably you should do or not. But how do you make that decision on what characteristics of the site or of the place you pursue in terms of, or how you translate those moves? and make it more, I guess, regional or side related. And what? what are those things that you... Well, for example, um, I was just rereading Roger Scruton's The Aesthetics of Architecture. And Roger Scruton says, to answer your question, that architects create problems in order to make solutions. In other words, there are no solutions unless you create the problem. He says that Bach uh, in the Goldberg Variations creates the problem, the tonic problems, so that he can produce this. You don't know ahead of time what the solutions are until you've produced the, the, the problem, right? And the problem doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in function. It doesn't exist in, in uh, history. It doesn't exist if you are, in a sense, in, in a mode of transgression. So that um, what, what the, the artist architect, does the, the the architect who or the architect who's an architect creates problems in order to solve them, uh, and you can say which problems did you create? Well, we created a lot of problems for ourselves, um, and it happens as you're working through the project. I promise you, no architect worth his or her salt starts out knowing what they want to do. Because if they did, they wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be worth doing. And so what you do is set up problems that you don't know the answers to, and you keep elaborating those problems until you are able to find answers for them. That's the only way I can tell you. I mean, I don't wake up. I mean, like I woke up this morning at 5 o'clock, and I said, I'm not going to give this damn Derrida lecture. It'll kill these people. <laughs> I mean, it really, I mean, it is really dreary. Okay, and I said, why not have some fun? Let's show them this thing, right? I want to make friends. You know, I want to be loved. Even though I'm loved this uh, it's a holiday. It's you know, football weekend. I, if I was at Cornell, when I was at Cornell on a Friday afternoon, and they had a lecture, I wouldn't go, right? Because I was ready for the party, right? Uh, so I really appreciate them being here, and I said to myself hey, why not show them the project, right? And I, I, uh, I made a decision to do that. Uh, and that's the way I work. You know, I, I, I work through things. I mean, um, the first idea I had for this Derrida lecture was there were no corners before Derrida. And, and I started working through it and I said, I don't mean there were no corners before Derrida. I mean there were no corners after Derrida. And that's what I really meant. Now, I didn't, I, I took an intuitive leap and said, before Derrida, and then I say, no, after Derrida. And this leads me to a whole set of things that I, I'm evolving uh, on the question of the corner of Derrida and rhetoric and the fact that rhetoric is now changed from a, a semantic and formal domain to a textual domain. And, if you look at Richard Serra's work, the first work on the corner is, is formal, uh, and the, uh, the latest work uh, is textual, and, and I've got a whole thing on Richard Serra and the corner. So uh, things evolve, right? And, and when you're thinking and working on these problems, 
then you know suddenly a, a project walks in like this uh, project in, in outside of Naples, Pozzuoli, and suddenly you say, hey, I know what I want to do on this project. Uh, it's not what the, the project is, it's what the architect wants to do. So it's purely a kind of haptic thing at the moment. You can't know ahead of time. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit more about the similarities, theoretically, between this project and the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin? Well, they're both field projects. Uh, one is a Euclidean project, and one is an attempt to be non-Euclidean. Uh, they both deal with uh, the ground surface in a, in other words, the most important surface in the Holocaust project is the molded ground. In other words, most people think that the ground is flat and the whole experience of being there is the up and down, uh, the, the pillars are, are vertical, uh, but the ground has nothing to do with this and you realize that it's the ground and people suddenly appearing and disappearing uh, in the ground and that's the thing when you you don't realize, you look at this landscape and you see a surface that looks very quiescent and, and, and easy because you can see over it from the sidewalk all the way around and you see this rippling surface. But then when you go into it, it is becomes very problematic uh, and, and in a sense tense because you go down from looking at something that's uh, a meter and a half four and a half feet above ground, uh, not enough to interrupt the eye, to go down 15 feet, and 15 feet in a two foot nine width becomes very uh, confining, isolating, uh, not something that you want to stay in. And you don't know where you're going, because at every corner, there's, uh, you either encounter somebody, there's no, you're not going anywhere. I don't know if I've ever walked the whole place. Uh, I, and I know where my favorite places are, but it's hard to find them. In other words, if you said, go find your favorite places, there's no way to find them easily. You know, you have to stumble on them and say, oh, here it is, because there, there are no directions. So it's, it's uh, I think, very similar in that respect. That would be my, my sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that microphone is. Um, I have a question. I don't know if anyone can see. No, no, there's a microphone. Uh, I have a question related to the process. And I think it's a beautiful project. And I can understand certain things. And I, I'm with you that I'm trying to understand more. Um, one of the things, looking at the process, and looking at that it's not a study that's done in abstract, uh, but it's done on site, it's got real conditions. Uh, what is the role of post rationalizing in case you don't understand? What I'm asking is if you, if you choose four patterns, right, you say it could be those or could be any other. Any, right. Um, but at the same time, well, the, the shaping building parts or the shape of the model of representation of building parts. So to what extent would you be interested in even going there and say, I really want to make this thing work or would you rather not win it and leave it there and do it uh, next No, no, no. Um, I, I, even though I might sound like I don't like to build, I do. Uh, I love being on a building site uh, a lot. Um, I love going to Santiago and seeing those six buildings and what you realize the scale of Santiago, you can look at it in drawing and in a computer, but when you're in the space, uh, I mean, we have 30 foot deep pochet in the uh, ceilings, you know, you know, that 30 foot deep is, um, you know, you say, holy jeepers, you know. Uh, you could put a whole army of people and store them in, in the pochet. Um, I seem casual about the building process, um, but I, I'm not as 
Had, I mean, yeah, would I like to build it? I, I didn't mean to say that you're casual. No, no, I, I think I sound casual. Uh, um, I, would I like to work out some of the things? Yeah. My problem is I'm not a finisher. I mean, all the people I have in my office are finishers, and I'm a starter. And they, we, we have this tension in the office because, they, you know, they, I mean, my wife's a finisher, which is great. And I, I, I can never finish anything. I'm always wanting, like, there's a book I'm supposed to be working on, and I got stuck into this corner thing, and I'm now working on that. And she's saying, what are you doing? You know, you, a book to Rizzoli was due on the 8th of August, I mean, 8th of, uh, of October. And I said, well, I mean, what does it matter, right? And all the people that work on, you know, the construction documents in my office say, Peter, for God's sake, stop, you know, doing these other things. And we don't need any more competition. We don't need any new projects. We, let's finish the projects that we have. And of course, the projects that we have all take 10 years to do. And I have new ideas, right? And I don't have any patience to think, oh, I mean, we're going to work this one through for 10 years, right? <laughs> I have other people in my office, that's what they do. They work through the projects. And there's an anxiety because we're supposed to be doing something today and I'm up here, right? Talking about this thing, right? They, the people in my office couldn't stand the fact that we inserted this in the middle, took all of my time this summer, destroyed the office for the summer, right? Um, still, we're out of money. I had to go borrow 100K today you know, to sort of feed this uh, thing. And my wife says, hey, that's my inheritance you're, you're, you're doing, you know. And uh, so I have a, a, a drug, you know. I mean, my, my practice is a drug, right? It costs me money to practice. Man will tell you, right? I still owe 1,200 bucks. Good luck. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, I, I, go ahead, Ann, last one, because I think I sense a certain yeah. Other people are still drinking. Okay, go ahead. Last question. Wow, this this take, this is a lot of weight on it now. No, no. Uh, well, I you know, I was just wondering with this interesting thing about moving the sensuous into the conceptual. At what point for you and your process do you think about the material aspects of the building? Was that important in this project? Oh, well, this show? this project was thought about the material. Oh, I mean, not usually. Not usually because my projects demanded immateriality, I'd say. Uh, they were reading projects, and so the material, but this project's not a reading project, it's an attempt to overcome reading, so the materiality of the project was very important in, in this particular case. Um, and, um, you know, Dean Ordenson was really important in it because he was the one that talked about what was the materiality of, you know, one thing is to pour concrete into sand, but what were we going to do with the rest of it? And, and it was he that uh, was able to figure out how we were going to have these printed metal, uh, arabesque printed metal plates and the uh, uh, enclosures uh, that we, you know, were working on and how we would do the columns and what would they be in? You know, I still don't know what those columns are. I mean, he knows, but, you know, I don't think they're metal. I think, you know, and how does the concrete, if they're concrete, join the metallic forms? Uh, so, yeah, they, it was a concern. Not, has not been, became one. Anyway, thank you all, and uh, we'll see you next time.